Good morning, church, and welcome to our 11 o'clock online service. My name is Benson McGlone. I'm one of the pastors here at Gainesville United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're joining us. We want to encourage everybody uh, to take the time to fill out one of our online connection cards. And if this is your first time watching our online service, uh, a very warm welcome to you and thank you for being a part of our worship this morning. Before we get started, we do have a few quick announcements for you. In October, we're going to be making a big push to help get people plugged in to different communities within our church so that they are not alone during this time, so that they have the support of their church family around them. And so we have a few small group opportunities that we want to share with you this morning. The first of which is our Women in Faith group meets every Tuesday evening. They would love for you to be a part of that. If you are interested in joining Women in Faith, uh, simply send our Connections Director, Samantha Allen, an email. Her email is connect at gumchurch.com. We also want to send a big thank you to everybody who has maintained and continued their generosity during this season. And we want to encourage you, if you aren't doing that, to grow in your faith through the act of giving. You can give online on our church website, or if you prefer to give in person, our church offices are open and you can come in throughout the week to drop off your giving in that way. Finally, we want to let everybody know if you're interested in becoming a member of Gainesville Church, Pastor John and I will be leading an online new member class next Sunday. That's Sunday, September 27th at 7 o'clock. If you are interested in being a part of that class, please RSVP to Samantha Allen. Again, her email is connect at gumchurch.com. As we prepare to worship God, to rejoice in the singing of hymns, and to hear his word spoken and proclaimed, if you would please join with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. I rejoice in all the people who have made this service possible. And Lord, we give it over to you. Put our hearts, our minds, our spirits in a place to sing you praises, to rejoice in hearing your word, and to have our lives transformed through this act of worship. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As Pastor John prepares to preach, let's just take a time to pray over him, to pray over our scripture, and to pray over receiving the word this morning. 
Lord, we, again, we just rejoice and thank you for this opportunity, for this time to worship you whenever we may be watching. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that it contains, for the teaching that it contains, for the life-giving power that it contains. And we pray this morning over Pastor John as he brings us our message. We pray that uh, his words would be your words that your spirit would speak through him. And Lord, we pray that you would open all of our hearts, our minds, and our ears to receive your word, to receive your teaching, and to have it impact the way we live our lives. We pray all this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Benson. Appreciate that. Welcome, church. This is the first Sunday that we've been doing a traditional online service. And so I just want to welcome all of you who, as Benson said earlier, might be doing this for the very first time. This morning, I wanted to share with you some of the things that have been going on in my life over the last couple of weeks. I've been doing a lot of thinking the last six months. A lot of thinking about our planning, what we're going to do in the life of this church, the things that we're going to add to the ministry of the church. I've been visioning for the future, I've been hoping that soon this pandemic would be over. And I've been doing a lot more praying. Last Tuesday was an anniversary of sorts. Sad one, but it was six months to the day when we canceled in-person church. March 15th. Seems like such a long time ago that we ended doing what I've done for over 35 years, leading worship in a building with people in attendance. This past week, I was also thinking about how we're handling this crisis. I started thinking about other crises in our uh, nation's history. And of course, I started thinking about my parents and their generation. You know, it was called the greatest generation and not without cause. They were an incredible generation of people. They endured the Great Depression. To put that kind of in perspective, The Great Depression had 25% of the workforce out of work. And in a time when most households were just a one-income household, they had one person earning a living. That meant that almost 25% of the households had little or no income. There weren't the social programs that we have today. And then they endured that for years. And then came World War II. Did you know that in World War II, in a population of 140 million Americans, 16 million men were in uniform during World War II. That was about 24% of the male population of this country were living in Army barracks, Air Force barracks, in Navy barracks, Coast Guard, Marines. They were away from family, they were away from home, and many of them were in harm's way. It was also a time of rationing. They rationed just about everything. They rationed gas, they rationed meat, they rationed sugar, they rationed dairy, shortening nuts, dried fruit, butter. They rationed coffee. Can you believe it? They rationed coffee. I wouldn't be able to drink nearly as much coffee as I drink today. My dad told me about a time during those days when there was gas rationing and you didn't really have access to a car. He went on dates by walking to the girl's house sitting around listening to records and drinking a Coke. That was a date in those days. That's all they could do. That was all before he enlisted in 1944. And not all the sacrificing that was done by the people of that time was mandated by government. No, people would go out and have scrap drives. They would go out and find spare metal, rubber, all sorts of things to bring it to recycling places that it was turned into things that were used for the war effort. And in this time, during this war, when everyone sacrificed, over 400,000 young men and women died on the battlefields, and over 700,000 were wounded. And yet America survived. They bounced back. In fact, I would say they probably bounced forward. No, I wouldn't just say that. I would declare that America bounced forward. So you might be asking me, preacher, what's this history lesson all about on a Sunday morning, the first Sunday that we're doing a traditional service that is online? Well, I'll tell you this. 
It's to ask you a question. When this pandemic is over, and one day it will be over, what kind of bounce do you want to have had? Do you want to bounce back simply to come back to where you were six months ago, eight months ago, whenever the pandemic is over? Or do you want to bounce forward? Do you want to go back simply to the way you were prior to the pandemic? Or do you want to be someone who bounced forward? Now, this is my apology to Comcast. I stole this out of one of their uh, commercials that they run on the radio, and I think it's on TV. It's one where they ask the question, what if you could bounce forward during this pandemic? So the question I have for you, do you want to bounce back to where you were before, or do you want to bounce forward? And for the message this morning, I'm not talking about job skills. Do you want to bounce forward in your job skills or your fitness level or schooling or weight loss? I've gained a few pounds during the pandemic or any of the other things that people are talking about and asking about. No, I want to talk about one simple thing. It's what we in the biz call the spiritual life. Do you want to bounce back to where you were in your relationship with God, in your relationship with Jesus Christ, or do you want to bounce forward? And I have another question for you this morning, and I'm not the first one to think about this, but I have a question. When this is over, when this all is over, the pandemic, what do you think you're going to wish that you did more of? What do you think in six months, eight months, whatever it might be, are you going to sit back and say, gee, I wish I would have done more of X. I wish I would have done more of this or that. I want to read the scripture for you this morning. And the scripture comes to us from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it's a safeguard to you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no con a confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For those for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, I want to know God, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Thanks for the word of God this morning. We thank you, O oh God, for your word. I know my answer to the question, do I want to bounce back or do I want to bounce forward? I want to do more in my relationship with Christ. I want to come out of this thing and say, gee, I grew so much in my relationship with Jesus Christ because I was attentive to it. Well, I think Paul gives us a little bit of a formula here for bouncing forward. It's a formula that requires a couple of things. First of all, it requires a lot of God's grace. It's not going to happen without God giving us a great deal of his grace. That's his unmerited favor. We're not doing this on our own. And it's going to require that the Holy Spirit is a part of us. Not just talking about the Holy Spirit, but an indwelling presence of the Spirit. And it's going to require also on our part 
a commitment to the process. And I want you to hear that. It is a process. It's a journey. It's not a snap my fingers and all of a sudden things change. So what is this formula? Well, Paul says it. Rejoice in the Lord. That's the first part of this formula. Just to make sure Paul's, uh, Paul has your attention, he says, I know I've told you these things before. I've been repetitive, and I'm going to say them again in the next chapter of this letter. Rejoice in the Lord. In fact, he'll say it twice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I tell you, rejoice. He's telling us here, rejoicing in the Lord means that I take the time to remember what Jesus has done for me. I've got salvation. My sin has been forgiven. My brokenness is being healed. Eternal life is mine. It's in the future, yes, an abundant life here and now. You know what I found in my life? Times that I feel most alive, most able to deal with life, is when I'm deeply connected to Jesus. I find also that there's more joy in my life. I'm not talking happiness here. Happiness is circumstantial. It's something that has to do with what's happening in my life right now. Joy is that thing that produces a quiet contentment, no matter what the circumstances are. I want that kind of joy in my life, and to find that, I need to learn to rejoice in Christ, in my relationship with him. One more benefit that Paul says that when we learn to rejoice in the Lord, he calls it a safeguard, a safeguard for our souls. Now Paul then pivots or he changes direction and he starts talking about how the fact is that there are these people out there, these Judaizers, he doesn't name them that way, but these people who are causing a great deal of problem in the early church, a group of people who demanded that before you could become a Christian, you had to become a Jew. You had to uphold all of the Old Testament law, the dietary laws, the feasts and the holy days, and then you had to have all males circumcised. If you don't know what circumcision is, I suggest that you ask privately to someone who might know. But Paul was saying that these people were mutilators of the flesh, and he was constantly battling this heresy. Now, it wasn't a big problem in the church in Philippi. They were a great church. They were, in fact, some people say his favorite church. They were such an enthusiastic, they were such enthusiastic followers of Jesus Christ. They were so committed. They were so generous in their giving. They just were a joy to Paul. So he does another pivot, and he comes back to one of his favorite subjects the supremacy of Christ. Jesus was enough. You don't need these things in the flesh. You need Jesus Christ. You need the cross of Jesus. You need the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's how we enter into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus. And that's where we find that's all that's needed. It wasn't about adhering to a law or circumcision. It wasn't about being confident in myself and my ability to be a good person or to obey the law. That's what Paul says. That's what he means when he says confidence in the flesh. It is all about Jesus. Now he goes on to make his point about credentials. He says, anybody else think that they have the reason to be confident in the flesh, have a reason to be confident in themselves that they are a good person all on their own? Well, I've got a heck of a lot more. Let me detail all of my credentials as a Jew. I was first circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. Very important in Judaism. I was a member, he is a member of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the original 12 tribes of Israel. He was fully a Jew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was very committed to his faith as a Jew. What's more, he was a Pharisee. If you don't know what a Pharisee is, this is a man who takes an oath before three other men and says, I will spend my life studying the law and all of its interpretation, the Mishnah and the Talmud. Not I'll spend a few hours every day, not I'll spend a couple of minutes every morning reading the Bible. No, I will spend every waking moment studying the law. And not only was he a Pharisee, someone that committed to the word of God, but he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, meaning he, at a very young age, he was given authority to go out and persecute the church, to have people arrested, to have them thrown in prison, hunt them down, and even had them executed. 
And just in case you weren't tracking with Paul on this, he, was, he ends up by saying, and according to legal righteousness, I was without fault. I was faultless. But then he goes on to say, I throw all of that away. Why? Because of Jesus. I consider it rubbish. Why? Because in Jesus, I found the true faith. In Jesus, I have found life, an abundant life. And he considers everything else a law compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. And he's given up everything, everything to follow Jesus. I know this is a tough one. It's a tough one for me too. The thought of truly being in a position like Paul. Paul saying that he's giving up everything of his former life in order to follow Jesus. How did he do it? Very simply, by rejoicing in Jesus. Daily, reflecting on the greatness of the gift, the gift that we've been given in Jesus. It's life, both here and now in abundance and also eternity. By rejoicing in the sure and certain hope that we have, by forgetting what's past, Paul says. I forget what's past. Past is past, folks. Learn from it, sure, but let go of it. Let go of the things that in your life that you regret. Let go of the things in your life that you have know were wrong. In Christ, you are forgiven. Let go. Then he says, he strains forward. He presses on. He strains forward to the high calling that's in Christ. Now, I don't know if any of you did this. I didn't. But on September 5th, there was a big horse race. Usually it's held in May. It's a big time thing. Everybody loves to go to it. They love to watch it on TV. It's called the Kentucky Derby. Had it in September. It didn't seem quite right. But if you've ever watched the horses when they run, look at their neck and their head and look at what they're doing. They're straining at the bit that's in their mouth. Their heads and necks are extended as far forward. In fact, the jockey has to kind of loosen the reins in order to not have them tear their mouths. If he pulls back too hard, he's gonna hurt the horse. Well, do you know that that kind of straining at the bit is exactly what the Greek word that Paul uses for straining means? It means like a horse straining at the bit. You wanna bounce forward? Strain forward, press forward, move forward toward Christ. Paul was constantly bouncing forward, continually coming to know the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For Paul, everything before had been unfulfilling, leaving him feeling empty. But in the power of the resurrection, of God coming down and dying on a cross in the person of Jesus, and then coming back to life, there's power there. That became Paul's foundation. That became his rock. And when the storms of life blew, and they did blow in Paul's life, he was beaten, he was arrested repeatedly, he was thrown into prison. In fact, when he was writing this letter, he was actually in prison in Rome. If you want to weather the storms that life throws at you, if you want to stand strong, not just endure, but stand strong in the midst of life's challenges, if you want to bounce forward and not just bounce back at the end of this pandemic, then the best place to start is with that common denominator, the lowest common denominator, and Paul outlines it here. He kind of implies it. He doesn't say it out loud, but he implies it. The thing in Jesus the reason why the supremacy and the greatness of Christ and the power of the resurrection is because there are two things that are the lowest common denominator, life and death. Jesus gives life and Jesus conquers death. You want to bounce forward? Let that be your rock. You follow the one who holds the vastness of the universe together. And he gives life and he conquers death. Paul pressed on to win the goal of heaven. He pressed on, he strained like a horse straining at the bit. See, Paul knew he had accomplished many, many things in his life. He was a brilliant student. He was a scholar, not just of the Talmud, the Mishnah, and the Old Testament law, 
but he was also a scholar of Greek literature. He was a brilliant man who had risen to great places of responsibility and authority by the time he was 26. All of that he counts as rubbish, and he lets it go because he presses forward. He presses forward, he strains forward to the high calling that is Christ, in Christ. You want to bounce forward during this pandemic? Draw closer to Jesus. Rejoice in what he's done for you. By rejoice, I mean remind yourself of what he's done for you on a daily basis. That will cause rejoicing. That will because of the power of the resurrection, the fact that God did what he did through Jesus on that cross and in that resurrection. Does this mean that you'll never have storms in life? No. I'd be foolish, 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 and I would have to be a much, much younger person to believe that that was the case. I've lived too much of life. I've experienced too many of the storms of life. It doesn't mean that we are going to be exempt from storms. It just means that we will stand strong and we will bounce forward in the midst of the storms. We can do more than bounce back when the pandemic is over. We can bounce forward. I pray that that's the journey that you get on today. Amen. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yeah. Thank you so much, Don and Janet. That was wonderful. As we continue to worship God, let's take some time just to pray together. And so I would invite you to join me as I pray, whether you simply repeat the words I'm praying or just take this time to pray in silence. But this morning, we just want to pray over our church, pray over our congregation, especially in this season. And then I'll close us out and would invite you to pray out loud with me the Lord's Prayer. But let us pray. Father, we thank you for our church. We um, just rejoice in the ways that you are working. 
We thank you that you continue to show your goodness. You continue to reveal yourself even in the midst of this difficult season. We take this time, Lord, to pray over each and every single person in our congregation. We pray for those who are hurting, Lord. We pray for those who feel lonely. We pray for those who are feeling a lack of community. We pray for those who are struggling. God, we pray your spirit would just be upon them in mighty and powerful ways, Lord. That you would bring them comfort, that you would bring them hope, that you would bring them peace. Lord, that they would know that they aren't alone and that your spirit would work within those of us who are in a good place, who are in a healthy place to reach out to them, to be with them, to care for them, Lord. God, we pray just an outpouring of your spirit over our whole church. That we wouldn't use this time to back away from you, to walk away from you, Lord, but that we would use this time to find new ways to grow in our faith, to grow in our commitment to you, to grow in our love for you, Lord. God, help us to remember that you are still God, that you are still good. And there is nothing that can happen in this world that can take away our salvation, that can take away the saving work of Jesus Christ. That through the work of your Son on the cross, we have been redeemed. Our sins have been forgiven. And even in the midst of these difficult times, we can live into the newness of life, into the fullness of life that you have called us into, that you have promised us, Lord. So we claim those promises this morning. And Father, we take this time to raise our voices to you, to pray together to you the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Folks, as we virtually leave today, again, I ask you the question, and my apologies to Comcast, but they weren't the first ones to use this idea. Bouncing back is great. Bouncing forward is Christ-like. May we be a church during this pandemic 
and when we come out the other side say, we bounced forward. And may God give us the grace to do that as individuals and as a church. May the Holy Spirit fill each one of you that we have the strength and the courage to bounce forward. Amen.